Is that how you pronounce it? Am I pronouncing it's either it either right? Ari or Ari, but Ari, gross. But, but do you remember him sitting with Rachel and he does? He oh, says, yeah. "Oh yeah, yeah." He, he convinces her to get closure, and he is he that really, the episode? Yeah, I've watched that one recently. Yeah, okay. he's he's a, he's her date, and it's on that particular that, episode, on that particular episode, and so he's the guy that in that one scene convinces her to call and get closure, and then he really sells the uh, "we need the check" sign. He does. I, that part sticks out. Because I remember thinking, like, is this where this is from? No, people have been doing... People have no. been signing invisible checks in the air. Ari Gross <laughs> invented... He invented the sign language for check, please. Uh, oh, you're very grossing it? That's what people call it when you write a check in midair. Hey, everyone ever, and welcome to 20th Century Pop, the show where we try to understand the present while living in the past. My name is Tim Blevins. And I am Bob Canning. Timmy Tim Tim. Yes. uh, Yes. I'll I'll say Bob because it took a lot of time for you to say the name you said. Yeah. What? What, What's up? I was just going to say, I'm kind of surprised that it's taken us this long to get to the topic that we are going to talk about tonight Um, because it's... It's sort of it's such a meaningful topic, I think, for you and I, for for many reasons, or at least I think it is. I should check my notes. We might have two different topics. Um, welcome to the that, show, that everybody. Could be. That could be. Uh, well, we're talking. See, I don't think so. Yeah, we should get right into it. That's always a nice way to start. <laughs> I don't know if tonight's <laughs> topic is that far off from stuff we've talked about before. To be honest, right. I, I exactly. don't. I don't think this is a really out of. I think we have talked about this before. We're, we're um, uh, again, we're, welcome to the show, everyone. Uh, we're, we're doing a segment. Why don't we just get right into it? We're doing a segment tonight, uh, a segment we've, we've, we've done before on the show called Binge and Podcast. Uh, Binge and Podcast is a segment where we find a show from our past, from our youth, you know, childhood or college that we watched, you know, we'd watch every week and we take a couple episodes, three or four episodes and we binge them the way people watch shows now, one after another, kind of to revisit it and see if one, it holds up to just to kind of see what it's like to experience the show outside of the format of week to week. And I say that today's topic isn't that far fetched because today's topic is part of, I think, probably the most important block of television programming from our college years, maybe even from before that, definitely from after that. We're talking about kind of about NBC's must-see TV block today. Wouldn't you agree? Are we kind of talking about Thursday nights, the 8 to 10, two-hour period of time where you get Friends and some other comedies following right behind that? I mean, that, that that's that's an introduction to tonight's topic, right? Yeah, that's a decent introduction. Um, I, th- I narrowed it down per your instructions <laughs> <laughs> yes, to, that's, to that's, one that's, particular that's, to show. To one particular show. <laughs> I guess why I'm holding off a little bit is because I don't know if if it if something still exists in the world, a time of night where the nation, where your own subgroups and everything, all watch a program in unison. I mean, is that still happening? Maybe people did it with Game of Thrones. People do it with opening nights and movies. But do you think... TV, I guess I'm curious, like, what 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 does must-see TV mean to you or meant to you what 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 is that concept before we get into today's topic uh what did it mean to me in the past it meant what what you said basically like there was either one show that everybody was watching at a particular time uh or there was a string of shows on and the, on the same night that everybody was watching a string of shows like maybe caroline in the city right suddenly susan single guy inside schwartz the single guy, thank you. Man of the people. Did you say Veronica's Closet? Veronica's Closet. Jesse. And Mad About You early on. Did you watch a lot of Must See TV? Was that uh, factored into your view- viewing life? Yeah, I did. Uh, college is, is where it started for sure. Um, I think you and I uh, went to Friends separately, like when we first started watching it, and then we... Um, spent so much time together that we ended up watching it together quite often. I feel like, yeah, I feel like after college, we watched a lot of yeah. friends together. Yeah. Um, but it was there during college. And um, and yeah, because it was a different uh, 
different way to view TV than it is today. If you're watching Friends at Eight, you generally stayed for the next couple of shows. Um, I enjoyed. Now why is that? So, why were we roped into seeing these other shows? I don't know. I think because they did the smart thing where they had Friends at Eight and then Seinfeld at Nine or whatever was the next best one at nine. Frasier um, eventually Frasier. took his place, but I think it was Seinfeld for the duration of college. And that's, yeah. that's true. That's tricky, though, because we watched the crap <laughs> that was sandwiched in the middle. Yeah. We, we would. It depended on, for me anyway, it depended on um, the era. And I think this was 1999. I would watch Friends. I would make out with my girlfriend we would watch Seinfeld. I would make out with my girlfriend. We'd watch ER. Yeah, I remember jerking off during ER myself. Okay. Um, well, that's that's a weird place to drop that story, but that's great. Well, I'm Good just for trying you. to think because I don't have as much as many memories of those in between shows, save for the titles that we have been dropping. I mean, neither do I, but I'm not bringing up, um, you know, <laughs> what happened to there. Thursday nights were a magical time because it wasn't quite the start of the weekend, but it was close. Yeah. You had already gone through a bunch of days. And then these shows, again, I I mean, I can't stress how important Friends was to us growing up and how much we got out of that. But these other shows fell into that line, too. And the show we were going to talk about today in just a minute did this. But before we do, I want to revisit... A conversation I know we've had before because it's one of those things. These shows, we're talking about shows about 20-somethings, and we're talking about being almost 20 or 20-something watching it. Right. I come back to this constantly. You always give me the same answer, but I'm going to come back to it again. (laughs) These shows that we watched and loved and felt like we related to, did did we like these shows because they mimicked our life? Or did we mimic these shows to make our life like them? Um, Well, I wonder if this is the same answer I always give you. Um, But my short answer is that I feel like our lives were, were similar, but they weren't quite there. And we wanted them to be there. And so, yeah, I feel like I, I personally would mimic or at least exaggerate more my 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 natural state and my natural frame of mind in a more comedic sitcomy way based on these shows that I was watching. These shows, the must-see TV shows that I was watching, informed my views of um, of relationships. Mm-hmm. You know, I think these shows with their soap opera pace kind of sparked something of like this long-term you know, romantic burning that you hide for, have for someone, you know, and the need to hide these feelings from that person. And, you know, you become friends with this person and, and eventually you become close with this person. And, and then, you know, uh, at some point it, it sprouts into a meaningful relationship, but then you, you know, you face some sort of obstacle of somebody coming in and it's just these shows play to that thought and theory so well, the Ross, Rachel, will they or won't they? And all these other shows that then use that. Yeah. But I think that spoiled my mind mind for what a relationship was. And I think I got a lot of this um, from these shows. Because again, these were shows that were reflective of me in, in many ways. There were young people finding themselves. There were a circle of friends. But I also think the the nature of making a show dramatic, and I say this because I think it's going to come up in our conversation today. The 90s were a period of soap opera sitcoms that were centered around the struggling romance of how do you get this person to know that you like them? And honestly, that ruined me Mm. and made me a horrible person in how I treated people for a period that I had crushes on and was attracted to because it's using them as a plot device, which is what these shows preach. Right. And I know we have talked about this before, but it's been a while, so I'm just bringing it up again. Like, I, I do you share this? Do you think that this show altered how you interacted with people you had crushes on um, de- detrimentally? It, it, it probably did, but I don't know another way. You, you know what I mean? Like the my way of interacting and flirting and and try you know we would throw parties uh when we were living together post-college for the sole purpose of trying to capture or create that moment from one of these shows where we make the the joke and have the conversation and now suddenly 
Like, like I, that's, I didn't really date in high school. I didn't really know myself in high school. So when I was flirting and making out and, and having any of these romantic moments, it was post having watched friends post Seinfeld post single guy even. Um, so that's how I thought you did it. Stark raving mad. Was it post Stark <laughs> raving mad? No, it was actually, yeah, it probably was post Stark raving mad. I, I feel like these shows were educating in a way. I was basing my life on, on these shows. Yeah. And I asked that because I think a couple so we, you know, we're, we met in college. We're going to Emerson college. This is happening in college. I feel like a couple years into college, there was an example of the reverse of that. I feel like for hmm. everything where we're trying to make our lives like these TV shows, suddenly in 1996, so during our sophomore year, a TV show on NBC's Must See TV Night came along that I remember thinking, oh, this is trying to represent my life. Like, literally. Not so much like, hey, I relate to this. This is my life. But here's a show that's now trying to be my life. And that show, that program, that lead up for a joke that I didn't think ahead of time to write, so now I can't make a reference to a show that only lasted a season or two. Renegade, was that on for a while? <laughs> that was on for was quite a, a show? while. Too long, Was it really? That was on for like, a while. Like, I think it was an NBC show, long? and then it went to syndication. Like, somebody... Elt bought it and it, it went to USA or something. The Lorenzo Lamas yeah. Renegade. Mo- motorcycle Lamas guy, yeah. That was motorcycle like Lamas guy, sure. Six he's years. Th- to be clear, he's a human. He's not a llama who rides a motorcycle, but the or you know, or merging of the two, but yeah. Um what, but which the, is show, the better show though? The the better show? That would the, be the amazing Lama thing. show or the actual renegade show? Which one was the better show? Would be the better show. I'm, I'm just, I'm, voting, I think I'm putting Renegade my vote out still for the llama be, is all I'm saying. I feel like wrangling a llama into like, say, a romance scene or a scene where it has to cry because somebody killed a relative is probably very difficult. <laughs> probably. It would take a lot of time and I don't know how that would be. <laughs> but the program I'm referencing, the show that I think when we were in college, when it hit, we were at a point when it hit. And I'm mentioning it because... Even before I say the title, this was a show I did not like when it aired. Okay. This is a show I have not thought about in a while. And this is a show I was suddenly so certain I wanted to go back to for the sheer reason that the show we're talking today, talking about today, this must-see television show, television, 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 television show, aired at a time when you and I were at Emerson College. That's right. In, in Boston, Massachusetts. In Boston. In our... 20, probably hitting age 20, living in a dorm, living very near to an area of town that is referred to on maps and in signs, because that's what its name is, as <laughs> the Public Gardens, which I love, which is directly across the street from the Boston Commons. And today, we're discussing a two-season, I think it lasted two seasons, sitcom Really? Two Uh, seasons? Two seasons, created by David Cohan and Matt Muchnick, uh, two people who gave us will and grace, so I'm forever indebted to them. Matt Muchnick graduated from our alma mater, Emerson College. That's right. um, Which is going to come into play, I think, during this discussion. But we're discussing the sitcom that they premiered at 8.30 on Thursday, March 21st, 1996, a show called... Boston Common. Yes, starring uh, Anthony Clark, a stand-up comedian that I guess was pretty well known in Boston. Did you know him before the show started, Anthony I, Clark? I knew I knew of him as a stand-up comedian before the show. He was on Doctor Katz. That's 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 mm. kind of what I knew him from. Sure. Uh, also featured uh, is it Heidi Barres as his sister? I believe it's uh, Hetty. Hetty Barres. Yeah. Um, she was in a movie called Foxfire this same year, which she, is what I had first heard of. Uh, she was. From. Uh, Tasha Smith, an actress who played a character named Tasha, um, the female version of Ari Gross, Trailer Howard, played a love interest <laughs> named Joy, and some douchebag who looked like a lot of 80s guys was in it. But but this show, like I really remember this <clears throat> show premiering because we were living in the Emerson dorms, mm-hmm. and suddenly here came a show from an Emerson grad about life at a fictionalized... Um, Emerson College. Basically, yeah. Basically. And, and like there was a rallying cry around or do you remember around campus of this is premiering on this night and we oh, have yeah. to watch it? It was a big deal. 
Um, did and we I was, watch it together? I don't know if we did. I don't have a recollection of actually watching the premiere episode. Uh, but oh, I, do, I do. I taped it. Well, I remember you taped it very much. Yeah. Um, but I do remember that it was big news around campus. It was big news, uh, even on the Boston news networks. Like they were, <laughs> that's that's where they get their news. But it's like it, it was much, uh, much talked about. I remember it being. Um, I remember before it aired talking about how it happens or takes place in the student union, which I don't believe, I can't recall if you worked there at the time, but I worked in the student union of Emerson College um, basically for all four years I worked at the union. I sat desk, much like the desk in the episodes of Boston Common. Um, that must have blown your mind. It did. Man. I was very excited to see that. Because there it was, everything we've talked about wanting our life to be much like what is on Friends, this is exactly what you're saying. Our life actually being pulled out of the the, the memories of, of, of Max Muchnick, who went to Emerson. Anthony Clark went to Emerson. Um, and so that was going to be the Emerson College comedy show that we were living. And now we could also watch it on TV. So did you have a f- so yeah you had the feeling that that was going to represent us and I have to say, outside of the setting <laughs> of a college that could be Emerson, there is nothing <laughs> relatable on this show no. that I could look to and say, oh yeah, that's me. Yeah, I mean, what's what's the general gist? I know we didn't watch the pilot. We watched four episodes today, starting with episode three, which we'll get to in a minute. But what's the general premise of the show? What's the setup? Well, I actually, um, when I went to watch these, um, I actually started the pilot. Oh, you did? I okay. did, and the, just because I misclicked the the wrong thing, and <laughs> I remember accidentally, accidentally did some extra research. Yeah, so the the opening scene started. And then I was like, oh, no, we're starting with episode three. But I do remember the opening scene. Sure. I remember that they're driving to Boston, they being Anthony Clark's character, uh, Boyd. And To his, his credit, not a character with his own name. <laughs> there you go. Tasha couldn't pull that off. No. Um, so Boyd is driving his sister to Boston from, I believe, Virginia, down Wileen? south. Wileen? Is that the sister's name? Wileen. Wileen. I think. Uh, and she's going to school in Boston and <clears throat> the pilot kind <clears> of, <throat> excuse me, came back to me. I believe he gets her to school. His plan wasn't to stay in Boston, but he met Joy, played by Trailer Howard. The female Airy Gross. Correct. Not to identify by gender. Sorry, that was cold. Um, and then he ends up, you know, kind of getting a crush on her, kind of falling for her in that meet cute that I didn't see because uh, we started with episode three. Yeah, sorry that you missed that <laughs> so wonderful he, he piece stays, of television. He, he gets a job at the union, so he's not a student at the so school. So he's not. I was just wondering that three he's, episodes he, in. He's like, not a student a, at the No, college. he gets a job as like a repairman or something. So he works for the school now just so he could stick around, and he ends up getting an apartment with his sister, or his sister already had the apartment, and he's now crashing with her. Uh, so right off the bat, they're not living in a dorm. They're not in a dorm. <laughs> they're living in an apartment. One of them is a student. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other main character is not. Um, and then the other characters that he, that he Boyd interacts with are mostly non-students. They're mostly faculty uh, and and uh, uh, dean of school. What is that called? Dean of dean of students. Fuck. Dean of students. Yeah. But yeah, but I mean, that's a, so that pilot, and I didn't watch it. I've watched it when it aired, but I haven't seen it since. That does actually, it sets up a sitcom just fine. That's a fine sure. premise. You, you set up your Not love interest, we he gets the job. No, and that's the thing. Not the one we were <laughs> promised. Because I remember, I, you know, the, before we even start talking about it, I remember instant backlash to this show only because they made it a point on the news, like you're saying, to interview Emerson students. What do you think of the show? So to watch it, I apparently had enough of an ego of whatever I was at age 19, maybe. I was uh, 21 or 22. In 1996? Uh, yeah. Yes. Because I, I, I was... 21. Because uh, I was spring, right. spring of yes. 96, okay. I was 90, uh, I was 20. 
I remember thinking, this is not Emerson College. They're trying too hard. They're just putting, you know, because to me, it didn't, it didn't fit. It didn't work. It didn't reflect something. And it's like, what was I expecting, though? It's a sitcom. And it's a 90s sitcom. And it hit all the tropes of a 90s sitcom. I feel like outside of the sets, which were very inviting, and maybe some views, some exterior shots... This this is not the Emerson College show we were promised. But as a TV show, this show did very well in its did first it? season. This show was a top ten show. Well, it in followed its very Friends. First season, it did follow Friends. That could be a part of it. But people were tuning into this, and and I don't know. Like, what what are your initial thoughts of this as a sitcom, as a show, as the program that we watched? It was comfortable to watch. I didn't laugh a lot. But it was one of those comfortable type of things to watch. You, you know, it's a familiar setting. It's familiar types of characters. Um, there were some enough jokes that I didn't, you know, I wasn't dragged down by it. It wasn't like our abysmal needing to watch uh, 90210 Christmas special and the MacGyver Christmas special. That was hard. This wasn't hard, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't laugh out loud. It wasn't. A funny show, but it was, it did what it's supposed to do, I guess. You know, it, it set it up, it had characters, it was constantly moving. Um, it was fine. <laughs> and that's the show. Thanks for tuning in. No, well, let's take a look at the first episode. Yeah, okay. The first, because we, uh, this will help well, what us did discuss you think? Little... Did you, did you... Oh, what did I think? Yeah. I thought you were going to follow your, follow that up right away, but I will, I will drag that out of you. What do you think of it as as a as a sitcom? This watching this and the nature again watching things for the show is different from watching it when they're first on. This show reminded me that there was a lot of problematic issues towards the romantic soap opera plot lines of sure. 90s sitcoms. This show made it very apparent and very creepy that when you base a show and shows do this <laughs> around a main character who just develops a crush on someone and thinks they should be with them, but it doesn't tell them that that's a dangerous, that's a disgusting, that's yeah. a manipulative, and that's a sad character trait that I can all too strongly and fortunately relate to in that period of time. So I think I don't like this show, or I had trouble with this show, because the romantic storyline, the, the ongoing story plot between um, Boyd, Anthony Clark's character, and, and, and female Ari Gross's character, Joy, that plot line, which right from the start we're expected to put a lot of faith in and a lot of interest in, right. does not play well, but does play realistically. So this show, I think, causes me to judge myself harshly mm. during that era and TV as itself. But let's take a look at the first episode because I think that'll help set sure. things up. All right. Uh, the, f the first one we watched, it was the third episode. It aired April 4th, 1996. That's entitled I, The, and Dow. Um, it was written by the two show creators. I think they were the first three in succession. Mm. This one out of the four we watched was the one that I felt most relied on being in a college you know, we kind of get a plot that the school is slashing its budget, which means various extracurricular classes um, are going to be canceled or cut. And one of these classes, the character of Joy, the female Ari Gross's character of Joy, is she a teacher? She's a or a teacher's assistant at the school. Is that her position in the show? I took it as a teacher. I didn't get the teacher assistant. I, I okay. thought she was. I don't know that she was like a, a professor type, but she certainly was a teacher Teach okay so she 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 has this storytellers class is that correct i think uh, it's like a club it's a, a non-essential oh, okay. extracurricular yeah. club and so it's on the cutting block of we don't have enough budget we're gonna cut it so um boyd who has this uh, the anthony clark character who has a secret crush on her um sees this as like he could try to find a way to raise money to ensure that her extracurricular club remains he thinks um, because she's going to lose it, he'll find a way for it to stay there. And for somehow that'll become she'll notice that it's a nice thing that I've done for her and she'll like him more. And this is a standard sitcom plot. We see things like this all the time. We have to somehow raise money. We have to do it secretly and we're, and we're going to do it cartoonishly. And it's a good enough idea to hang an episode on, you know, particularly in a school place sitcom. I, 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 th I think a, a part of it, the problem with this or part of what I didn't like about the show is that. 
Well, one, the action of what he's doing is very manipulative, but we can get into that later on. But two, the character of Boyd, it just seems like his role on the show, and again, coming back into this with this episode, I'd kind of forgot, his role is to do a lot of shouting. His character is always yelling his lines, his crazy lines. He's such an optimist. He hears some loud lines yeah. so over the top and all this weird, unchoreographed physical activity, a lot of which is with his sister. He wrestles her and stuff like that. Yeah. And I have a hard time with that, that manic energy where it's like, I'm going to be Robin Williams. Well, you know what? I love Robin Williams, but that part of Robin Williams was annoying. <laughs> The goofy, I'm just going to get out there, sure. I'm waving my hands, I'm screaming. There's a bit in this. What ends up happening is to raise money, he holds like a revival. Like like he he, yeah. he brings all these financial backers in and he comes in and boy does this like cartoonish preacher bit yeah. um, where he's running around and, and it's like a big set piece. It's supposed to be like, look how wacky he is. Look how crazy it is. We're supposed to be applauding. And I just, that's a hard thing to pull off. And he doesn't play the main character well. I remember no. Anthony Clark as being kind of like a quiet, slow burn kind of comedian. He has a great uh, appearance on Dr. Katz um, early on in the Dr. Katz animated series. And it's very slow speaking, kind of like yeah. country bumpkin jokes. And this show is not that. And I respect the fact this show, they're not dumb country hicks. They're intelligent people from the South with Southern accents and Southern beliefs who, who, who are part of the school. But I just, I can't stand that kind of performance and when he's doing it because he harbors a secret crush on someone which is the 90s version of courtship <laughs> I, I i can't deal with that because it's just he's just a manipulative prick he's just lying and also it's just kind of like so if she gets the money and she keeps teaching her class, why is she going to like you more? Right. What, it's just, it's a weird cylindrical thought process that I could, again, wholeheartedly relate to and hate it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the, and you're made to want to root for him in, in that scenario. In, in all of those scenarios, um, you're supposed to be rooting for this one person who, like you're saying, is manipulating situations and being backhanded about it and um, trying to basically destroy a relationship that already exists, you know, which inherently with a douchebag, um, which the is female again, Eric Gross to, is dating a guy named Jack, and yeah. he has to be the douchebag, otherwise you would feel terrible for what's what this guy's doing, and, and instead you're supposed to be rooting for him. At the time, I guess, yes. But now you're absolutely right. Like, there's nothing likable about Joy's boyfriend. And that's kind of where the show suffers. Like, there's no tension because he's not interested in Joy. So we don't really care about his opinions, yeah. the character of Jack, her boyfriend. It's just, yeah, it's it's like you're just saying. It's a, it's a cutout obstacle to validate Boyd's actions. And, and that's like... That's like a lack of characterization, lack of drama, lack of plot, and very much what 90s TV was. Why is that? The characters of Ross, the characters of the single guy, the, the, the character of Boyd, why was it that TV was populated by these wisecracking, awkward, in their own way, gentlemen who are just suddenly endearing to their secret crushes like why is was that so spread about television i don't feel like that was a template before tv i feel like we're getting away from that now but in the 90s and when we were in college that was the route to go that manipulative sad i'm owed something arrested developed child that i very much was who gets their own show and is now pursuing this character uh, who is also dull the character of Joy is a dull female lead. Yeah. You know, I, I think, I, I think she was probably, you know, she, you, she was enough of a cipher that you could hang on whatever you're looking for onto her to get it. But the point of the show isn't are they going to get together. The point of the show is is Boyd going to get her? Yeah. Because if we're going to identify with Boyd and be that character, then we can make the character of Joy whoever we have our crush on. And he's going to try to get her. And why is that? Why is that soap opera? Because that requires an ongoing plot line to work. You can't do that all in one episode. Why was that 90s television? I wish I had an answer for you, sir. I do, too. Because it, it would make it, that question seem like a good section it, it's, of the no, podcast. But it, 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 uh, I don't know. I mean, 
what was before it? Maybe we can kind of reverse engineer this. Like, I don't recall watching a lot of uh, relationships that comes uh, – Cheers comes to mind. And mm-hmm. Cheers had a different romantic dynamic. These were two single, uh, fully formed adults, as I can recall, in Cheers. Um, they were interesting. These were interesting characters. They were interesting. They were single. They were living their lives. Um, they had every right to – you know, flirt and interact and do what they, they felt like they needed to do. Uh, what else was there out there? The love boat? Uh, I don't, you know, I'm trying to think of romantic Well, you're not feeling comedies. following the same romantic characters. I think, you know, sitcoms, I don't know, like we we had, I guess The Wonder Years isn't a show I watched, but there was New uh, Heart? Kevin pining for, well, New Heart, he was with someone. I think he had a lot of relationships with people already together. Family Ties. I, uh, wasn't there, who was it on Family Ties that liked Mallory? And Mallory oh, was always with somebody else. Nick and Mallory were together on Family But, but no, who was the, the nerdy guy? Oh, Skippy. Mallory? Skippy Handelman. Yeah. But see, you weren't rooting for Skippy. Well, he wasn't the central character yeah. of them. Mallory would be. Mallory yeah. would be a pretty major character right. there. Right. And, and you just knew they weren't going to get together, Skippy and Mallory. Mm-hmm. So I'm just, I, mean, I don't know. And then uh, then you had your 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 Punky Brewsters and your, your different strokes. And that was not... Uh, yeah, I don't remember the romantic Grown pursuits of romance. the 10-year-olds, but, but well, and, and maybe that's what we're looking at. We're, we're kids watching these shows, but, like, there are definitely high school shows. I mean, Mike Seaver and Growing Pains dated people. Uh, uh, Samantha on Who's the Boss dated people. But the, but the, those storylines, maybe because they were both invested in the characters and maybe because they weren't the main characters, you kind of just followed them on along on an innocent sort of getting together. Plus, they were kids. Right. You know, a relationship as a kid is asking someone to the prom, you know, getting the courage to ask somebody to the prom and to say yes or no. And that's your relationship. And they weren't These serialized are, either. That's the other thing. Well, maybe that's something. For some reason, the 90s, and I don't know where this started. I don't know if it's, I mean, Cheers had serialized stories to a degree. But yeah, the sitcoms on must-see TV, that block, were very much, you had to watch it every week. Yeah. And that, I guess, helps the soap opera nature of this. I don't know. Like, did do you think, and can you remember, did 1996 you, as Bob Canning, did you, would you have found Boyd Pritchett's situation of having a crush on this girl who was with someone else who was a douchebag, would you have found that relatable? Uh, I would have. Yeah. I, yeah. I would have. Me I, too. I had that That's s- awful. I had that situation. I was. I felt hard for somebody who I knew very clearly was seeing somebody else. Um, and yeah, I, I probably, you know, tried to be that Boyd type character. I don't think I went as far. I never did a, a revival song and dance, uh, well, not religious in the perhaps. student union. I never did that. You know, it never went that far, but certainly I mm-hmm. would take some extra time to talk to her and, you know, she's walking that way. I have no reason to go that way, but I'm going to go that way and continue talking to her, you know? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, and I, I, it's it's a it's weird that this is a show that you were talking about the pilot, which seemed to be about Wileen and him coming to town. Maybe it'd be a show about this girl from the south trying to acclimate to being in the Northeast, yeah. coming to college, working all that. All of which I find very interesting. I have to say, the Wileen character of everyone on the show, I like her. Yeah, that's you know, the character I wish the show was about. And it's not about her. That's what I was just going to say. It's it's really Boyd's show. Um, Mm -hmm. which is, again, why it's not really a college show. It's more of a workplace show um, because you don't really get to know the students. And there's, like, hints of where things could have gone with, like, this a recurring student body where I think you you could have built out... you get, like, frat pledges, which I never saw in college. And you get, like, the film student who wears all black. You never saw frat pledges in college, Tim? At Emerson? No. Tim, the the uh, the bit in episode three where they're holding the brick and singing the song, yeah. that is what a fraternity at Emerson had their pledges do. They had to carry a brick really? around. Every, yeah. That was happening? That was straight from Emerson College. I'm sure they've done it elsewhere. but Nope. Emerson's the only one with a fraternity that I can think but of. But knowing that the co-creator and, and star of the show are from Emerson, and here we are in the student union with, with a frat holding bricks, I took that as a direct reference to that. that oh, uh, so that part Emerson. didn't resonate. That, those were the parts where I'm like, they're just sticking this in. Like, this show had a chance to be, 
like the Simpsons thing where it's exactly. like, here's your college yeah. and here's all the different lifestyles and these, you know, background characters with some, some interest, but they all just seem like surface interpretations. It, it could have been more of community, um, mm-hmm. which I know is not of the era that we like to talk about, but no, but it's a great show. They ended about up growing a and you got to meet more students further and further out of their circle. Um, mm-hmm. That was also an ensemble, which again, the show does not treat its cast as an ensemble. No, not in the same respect. You definitely have your center of Anthony Clark. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if the show was originally pitched to be Boyd's show, or if in casting him, the show kind of shifted the feature. Because again, he Anthony Clark became a breakout star either around this time or because of this. Like he he he's in what he's in The Rock. He shows up in that movie. I think his his stance as a stand up comedian kind of kind of expanded. Like he he was a breakout star. And then for a he brief ended period. up being in the. Uh, Three or four seasons, five seasons of Yes, Dear. Which is a lot of seasons of Yes, Dear <laughs> yeah. to watch. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, did you, and maybe you already said, did you like watching this episode? Was it a, a doable? Um, if, ultimately, he does raise the money, and I think her her uh, study group gets saved. No, because it kind of threw me, because I couldn't remember what the show was like, and this episode didn't seem like w- what the normal episodes would or should be. Because oh. he brought out the the choir and did the whole bit, and that just didn't seem it didn't it, on this reviewing. And again, I probably only saw this episode once before, if I even saw it, because I mm-hmm. don't I didn't really follow Boston Common. Um, I knew of it and I sought it out initially, but I didn't really stick with it. Um, so I couldn't tell you if I saw this episode the first time. But when I saw this episode this time, uh, it didn't didn't grab me. It didn't seem like. This was the right show, if mm-hmm. that makes sense. Like it just the right show to start with, or just well, to... I mean, I just maybe because I'm coming into it two two episodes in, I'm not too familiar with the characters. I don't quite remember them, and so the fact that he was trying to pull off this con, so to speak, because he even mm-hmm. had Joy playing a, a, a fake role and and uh, um, his sister kind of coming in, um, it was it was kind of a con for the alumni to try and get them to. <laughs> to raise more money and it just didn't make sense to me as i'm coming back to it it's like what is going on but again that's why after watching all of them it, it does kind of fit because it's not really a college show as i was hoping and remembering it yeah. to be now which is a letdown i think of the four that's the one that's most collegey because after that episode we watched episode four which is called our uh, relationship of fools it aired april 11th 1996 uh, this is an episode written by Genji Kohan, yeah. uh, sister to the series creator David Kohan, but also uh, the creator of Weeds and Orange is the New Black. That's Genji, yes. Yeah, this is one of her earlier uh, screenwriting credits. But um, this episode kind of keeps us going with the whole Boyd manipulating Joy to be with him plot. It kind of pushes it into into higher higher gear, I feel like. This is very much... An episode that doesn't have to take place at college, but is very relationship focused. Yeah. Um, Joy sets him up with a friend of hers, I think. And then Boyd takes that as a chance to get closer to Joy. Yeah, because they go on a double date. And so instead of turning down the date because he's more interested in Joy, he goes on the date because Joy will be there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the logic of that is faulty. The concept of that doesn't make sense. And yet, once again, embarrassingly, I relate to it 100%. The me of then, anyways. Because I did that. That whole thing of creating a situation where someone is going to see you with someone else Mm. and suddenly be into you. That's his plan. Yeah. And we're supposed to go along with it because the character, I think, I've already forgotten what the character he was dating was like and who it is, if it's an actress that we've seen before. But... I, what he's doing is creepy. And to the show's credit, both Wileen and his coworker friend Tasha acknowledge that he's deluded. I think Wileen even says he's manipulative. But for this episode to work, we have to think what he's doing is endearing, I think. Yeah, I think so. Again, we're we're supposed to be rooting for Boyd. And so we can't find him creepy. I, it's It's good, I guess, that they acknowledge it. Um, by having the other characters say it's not the right thing to do. And I think they also make it okay because it turns out the the woman he's been set up with is trying to 
manipulate Joy so she can get with her boyfriend. Mm-hmm. And so that, the, the, again... The, the 90s <clears throat> douchebag with nothing in common. Yeah, and so that, again, takes the weirdness uh, off of, of Boyd because he's not really hurting this girl's feelings in any way because she's using him, they're using each other, so now it's okay. But this is what they thought people wanted to see. It's, it's, it's weird to me. High romance on a sitcom. Manipulations to get to them, but not like... Like Seinfeld will give you a different relationship every week. And it's not believable, but it's changing. It's pointing out little aspects. Because that's a show about dating, I guess. Sure. What seems to be difficult with the show can't do... Because we, again, we're only four episodes into the show's existence. And these are characters that didn't have any history before, or the, the Boyd and, and, and the, the female Ari Gross character of Joy had no history prior to the show. So it's weird to me that already four episodes in, we're supposed to be thinking, yep, he's got to get with her. That's what he needs to do. Like to go back to what I think this show is doing or ripping off, Friends, the setup of Friends where Ross and Rachel, will they or won't they, they had a history that existed before the show. And he says it in the pilot episode. Ross, in the first episode of Friends, says when they were younger, he had a crush on her. She acknowledges that she knew, and maybe someday they can date. So it's set up in a believable way. And it carries us through the first season. Ross having this creepy crush on Rachel, but not wanting to tell her any further details in that first episode. Being jealous of her, actually taking her own life into her hands, and trying to manipulate situations to be with her. But for some reason, it plays along because there's a history there, and because there's other characters working in it, and because it takes a full season to kind of gestate. Four episodes in on the show, it's, it's, it just feels like it's plotted out. Like, here's the course we're going. We're going we're gonna to have a character win over a girl in eight, epi- eight episodes or whatever. And it's weak. It doesn't, it doesn't hit. And yet, I think at the time, I would be like, yeah, I get what he's going through. Sure. And that makes me a horrible <clears throat> person. Yeah. Like, horrible. Is it just that all the 90s sitcom writers were going through the same thing and that's just how, all they knew to write? I doubt it. Yeah, I, doubt. I don't know. I mean, I think they saw, I think there's a, you know, this idea of must see TV, I think, plays into this. Right. You can have a sitcom, an enjoyable sitcom like Sabrina the Teenage Witch or Mr. Belvedere or certain <laughs> episodes of I Married Dora, and it's enjoyable. And you catch it when you can. Maybe as a kid, you're like, I got to see that every Friday, but you watch it. Right. It's enjoyable. Yeah. You come and go. You can plug into any episode it's not this concept, must see tv no that's the thing this pressure <laughs> that i think friends and seinfeld connected uh, created of having to yeah. be the show that everybody would be talking about by the sheer nature of putting it on a thursday night you had to create these scenarios these invented dramatic scenarios and set them up in such a way that people are going to come back every week because you tricked them force them or somehow manipulate it and brainwash them into thinking like, oh, this this is an ongoing story I'm interested in. Yeah. The show is very seri- serialized. Am I using the word right? Yeah, in terms of that, I it's very so. interconnected. I don't know that it's very serialized. I mean, the romance is serialized. Yeah. But it's not well, like... What else is going on outside of the romance? That's the thing. Else, Where's Wileen's f- plot? Where's exactly. this character of Leonard's plot? Exactly. None of that else... Nothing else in the show is serialized. Everything else is just floating around it um mm-hmm. whereas like friends especially as it got into seasons two three and further um every aspect of everyone's life got serialized and it wasn't just uh uh ross and rachel um that, so who knows what would have happened if boston common kept going and they would have really got it, the whole gang involved well that's I would hope so because honestly, if we move on to the third episode Let's. to talk about this a little bit, episode five, um, boy, <laughs> the third gets episode, shrunk. episode five. Yes, that <laughs> sentence is the best. Third episode of our binge, fifth episode of the run, third on. third spelling of Wileen that I tried out in my notes. <laughs> oh, great! Is it W Y L E E E N? Because that's what I had. I ended up with W Y in this episode. I didn't start I with W-Y, I think that's which, right. which by the time I got to the third episode, I was like, W-Y is so obvious. Why did it well, take me that I think it's the Wikipedia long? spelling, so that <laughs> might be, that makes it accurate. Oh. But this episode, which um, was written by a writer named Barry Wernick, uh, who went on to write for another female airy gross show called Two Guys, a Girl, at a Pizza Place, oh. um, as well as the Nick Swartzen travesty grandma's boy. Um, of the four episodes we watched... Um, this might be the strongest episode. Okay. 
or is it? I I had the same feeling. You did, okay. Oh, because I feel like it's the one I enjoyed the most. Okay. Um, and I think part of that to what we were just saying is because it gives Wileen something to do. Yeah. N- not not enough, but um, right. this is an episode where she goes to a therapist because I think she's having. And correct me if I'm wrong. She's having trouble fitting in at school. She's having trouble. Oh no, nope. is it relationship based? Nope. It's yeah, because it's school. It's not school. It's based. not school okay. based. It's she's having. Um, it, it, she feels smothered by her brother. She feel that like, is what the reason yeah, is. Okay, like she lives with her brother. She can't just live her life and acclimate herself to college life. So I guess it's sort of college, uh, but she can't be her own person because her brother right, is right, still right. around. Okay, and that's great. Yeah, that's what the show needs because the one thing that I think does work on the show and where I like it is that her and Anthony Clark's brother sister combination, by this point, anyways, is pretty believable. They're believable as relatives, yeah. I think, mainly because she wasn't cast to just react to what he says, and he's not an idiot. Yeah. Like, they get along. You And again, it's a relationship I don't get. It's a Southern girl, Southern guy, so that what they talk about, their references, their relationship. And that I enjoy that. And this episode explores that a bit. Because you're right, that's why she's there in therapy. And she gets some good lines. She gets some good jokes. I did laugh at, I think she, I think Wileen acknowledges the stereotype all of us are working on when she says the Southern jokes are not untrue yeah. is a line that she has. And like, I enjoy that. And it shows what this show could have been because what we, what I didn't have, I guess you have it a little bit with Ross and Monica. Now that I think about it, <laughs> I didn't have a lot of shows that I watched about siblings and siblings supporting each other. And I had a scenario like in this the nineties in the nineties. Cause I, exactly. I think it was mostly siblings in the eighties for me. It was, but we were kids yeah. living at home. Yeah. The, dealing with siblings Grown up as siblings. an yeah is very different. Yeah. And honestly, shortly after this show aired, my sister came up to Boston and she started college, and we had you know not the same kind of relationship, but we we were close, and, and that interaction was there. Roommates for so a while. We were roommates for a while. The three of us. Oh were my roommates. god! There's a sitcom right there, Tim. <laughs> that's right. We tried hard. <laughs> that's what it could be called, <laughs> and that's what we did. But I don't know. I, I this episode might work because of that. <clears throat> That part is something different. It's something new. I'm not watching shows in the 90s about siblings. Again, Ross and Monica, I guess, sort of. But there's something endearing about that. And they skit, skirt over it to accelerate this weird romance between Boyd and Joy with a very freaky subplot that I'm thankful I did not relate to and really put me off the show. Are you talking about the uh, listening in on each other's therapy? Yes, the vets. Yeah. Boyd goes for some reason to Wileen's therapy and realizes that when you're in the waiting room, you can hear the therapy session through a vent above one of the chairs, which, by the way, is a huge <laughs> fault that would have been discovered years ago. Well, I think they did discover it. That's why they kept the vent closed. But it was a rather oh. hot day, so he opened the so vent was and open. discovered you could hear. Now, by chance, he also learns that uh, female airy gross joy also goes to this therapist. Yeah. A television coincidence. That's fine. But so she's there one day and he can hear her and what she's talking about through the vent. And he figures if he starts coming every week. Yeah. Just listening to it. No, if he starts coming to the waiting room every week when she's in there, he can hear stuff through the vent, get to know her more and use that to bed her. To get together with her, to make the relationship happen. And that is crossing a line. Yeah. That is incredibly manipulative. Well, he struggled that is with it, Tim. He struggled with it. He opened he it. He it. closed it. He wasn't sure if it was the right thing to do. But he was uh, there doing it. Th- he, and, and that's the thing. His doing it is the problem yeah. with these kind of sitcom heroes or ingenues. He's lying. He's using female airy gross joys frailties and he's manipulating her secretly to win her over he has no respect for her privacy or the struggles she's discussing in therapy he just wants to find a way to ultimately get into her non male airy gross pants not her good graces not to get her trust not to date her but just to 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 bang yeah bangs is in my notes for some reason to bang her you know, and that's Ross. That's the character of Ross. 
That's the character of Holden Ross, in Chasing Amy. And that was us in college. Ross and that's was gross. in love. No, he wasn't. I felt... Ross hadn't seen her in six years. <laughs> and then her appearance made him remember that crush. So he was using her to get ahead because he was unhappy with the marriage that had fallen that, apart. That's true. And he and he's just not very good with women. Uh, and here's a safe... This is the problem with Ross. Here's someone you see every day so you don't have to make an effort. By nature of your friendship circle, you're going to see her. So why not develop a crush and just get mad at the choices she makes that doesn't involve you? Because you're guaranteed to see her every day because she's living with your sister. Mm. Why did we think this way? And am I wrong in including you in this? Why did I think this way? I thought this way to to some degree. It's gross. It's disgusting. It's manipulative. It's embarrassing. It's what I thought relationships were. And that's awful. That's not read off a note, by the way. That was Those were all very in-the-moment sentences. Sure. I wrote the word gross, but I think that might be because of airy gross. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was, it, it was all we had. I mean, just looking at the list of <laughs> shows. What does that mean? I mean, it's, it's what we had. It's like, was there a sitcom out there that treated these types of relationships or any relationship uh, with dignity and... and correctness uh, for lack of a better word uh. was crossing jordan on at the time i don't know but why is that there are books out there i guess there are films there are human beings why did we <clears throat> why was this our go-to of how to act sitcoms, sitcoms. the half hour sitcom the easy to ingest thursday night program because it the idea of a series, we know how TV works. We know that shows keep going. So the idea that this show has to sustain itself to ultimately, ultimately the goal of a show is to reach a finale. It'd be, a, you know, normally the season finale of interest. Yeah. And you keep that going with more drama. And so if there's a romantic subplot, of course, the idea is they get together. But the, the journey to it, right. the struggles, the bumbling, the entertainment of it, to know that it's going to be ultimately rewarded because it's destined to be and you mind controlled her, which is what are the two topics of this happening. That's fulfilling. So all these crushes I was getting, all these people I was so sure I was in love with, and all these secret feelings I kept to myself were in service of just maintaining a season of my <laughs> life, of the series. Like, I'm sure I didn't love half the people I claimed to love. I don't even know what that word would mean. Right. But there were people I was close to, so instead of accepting them as friends, I created scenarios, boundaries, and secrets to create the, my own little sitcom. Which is the most dishonest act I've ever done. And I once stole a pack of donut gems by eating them in line oh my at a quality goodness. mart waiting to be rung up. And that's pretty low, too. I mean, this is probably the problem with John Hughes movies. I don't know. I haven't thought those through enough. But but this, this 90s, 20-something, I deserve this person, and I'm going to struggle to get the mentality, making it the value. That's just did we learn that from these shows or were we, again, I'm repeating the question because I guess I don't know. Did we learn that from these shows or were we drawn to these shows because they reflected that in a week to week dramatic fashion before ER aired at 10? I, I'm trying to recall if I had those feelings, those thoughts, um, those scenarios in mind before college and i don't think i did i don't think i did because i didn't have the social structure right. being on my own right and so as you know like we've talked about it as we're learning to live on our own and be our own people and these are the shows that are on i think they did give us this sense of how things are supposed to be um consciously or subconsciously Hopefully, I mean, probably subconsciously. Um, only in retrospect are we really putting it all together. I don't know, because these shows were watched by millions of people. Is that the mindset of millions of people? No, I don't think everybody would react to them the same way. But I think we were just at a time in our lives where it made sense. Where these, like you say, these are the closest things that we could relate to. These characters were the closest things um, on television. Um 
it's it's hard to to emulate the real people around you because they're going through the same kind of stuff you're going through. You need to see something else that's more confident and and more um, structured and some, you know and honestly that make you laugh that entertain you and so if that's entertaining and I want to be entertaining I want to be liked then I want to be like these shows these characters. So is that healthy to have that? No, probably not at all. But it's I don't. So what should we expect from our sitcoms? What what do they owe us? What should we be getting out of half hour comedy for the would last track? One expect that you should be getting some laughs. I don't think you should be getting lessons, but they tried giving us lots of lessons in the eighties. Um, it's it should just be entertaining and and funny, but you're right. There needs to be something there to keep you coming back week after week, and that keeps you engaged. That keeps it must see, and that's where drama comes in. That's where roadblocks in relationships have to happen. Otherwise, it's not as interesting, perhaps. Perhaps this show, by the way, this particular episode we're talking about, does a pretty clever drama thing to get you back in the in the next week. I have to say, the end of this episode, I was like, "That's good oh, yeah. TV." Yeah, the last couple of seconds, it's a pretty. What what happens so, at the so end? What's twist this at clever the end, thing? Um, the whole. Part of how uh, Boyd knows that you can hear through the vent is because he listened to somebody that wasn't Joy f- first. That's who he heard first. And then he went in and had his session. And he, in his session, he talked about Joy. And, and I think the joke that the, the tag back that comes back is he says, if you say Joy, 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 it sounds like you're on a on a trampoline or on a pogo stick. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's it's a, so it's a silly line. Um and then he comes out of the office, and that's where Joy is sitting. She has headphones around her neck, so you think maybe she didn't hear him uh, talk about her because she was listening to music on her headphones. Um, and so goes through the rest of the episode, and, and you're pretty confident that she didn't hear him. That's how it's established. But at the end of the episode, she uses the, the Boyd, Boyd, Boyd line to clue him in that now she knows and that's right at the end of the episode. She walks out, kind of looks back and winks at him or waves or something with a cute little smile. And uh, I don't even think she does that because I think it's uneasy. You don't know how she feels about y- it. Y- yeah. Like, I-, I mean, I felt like I came off of it as that she is now playing with him. Like she she knows and she's going to – she's kind of flirt. I took it as a little bit of flirting. Oh, I don't know. A little flirting I took back. it as a little bit of – putting him in his place and i loved it okay because finally something is happening yeah. that, that's a good situation he's found out he's uncomfortable and now if we want him like a, to like him as a character he has to confront those actions right that i was blown away <laughs> but the, you will not believe the final 20 seconds of tonight's <laughs> Boston Common fart sound, and I just I that, that was good drama. That was good writing because it just something was at stake. Sure, he was called out on a shit, and it was followed up the following week by the last episode that we watched, episode six, entitled "Virginia Reeling." Um, it aired on April twenty fifth, nineteen ninety six, written by the show's creators again, and this one follows up from that last episode and definitely shows like the soap opera plotting of the time. And again, it kind of unlike friends putting it out in the open very quickly. Like at the beginning, Boyd's kind of uh, avoiding female airy gross joy at work. He's kind of not wanting to run into her. Right. And his coworker, who we haven't even talked about, uh, T- Tash, Tasha, Tasha, um, I think is encouraging him to talk to her because she knows it's kind of weird. Yeah. She knows that he's avoiding it. And early in the show, within five minutes of the episode, they talk. Boyd and, and, and female Larry Gross Joy discuss what happened and confidently, not with a lot of bumbling around, yeah. not with trying to keep it a secret, not by making a list on your computer that says Rachel and Rachel, she's an idiot because she doesn't figure it out. Not the friend's <laughs> fashion is what I'm saying. Rachel. This is a very believable and mature follow-up <laughs> on the show called Boston Common Fart Sound. This is, I don't know, I, these characters are actually smart about relationships in this episode. And I liked that. Yeah. And that intrigued me a bit towards what this show uh, could be. 
I have to say, I kind of thought this episode holds up in that sense. Okay. I mean, I stopped watching the show after the first season, but I, I kind of enjoyed that because then the, the plot goes on. I, he goes line dancing with Tasha for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> and he, and he I invites... kind of thought, too, that because that, of what their conversation was, it was basically like, yeah, we can't do this. This just isn't meant to be. I'm with somebody. Meaning Boyd and female every girl's yeah. joy. And so I kind of even saw a, a, a Tasha thing starting here. Well, that was interesting. Yeah, because because right? because she was this whole time has been the best friend, and if it was her sitcom, she would be the Boyd character <laughs> manipulating him, trying to screw up the Joy relationship because she wanted to be with Boyd. But that, we weren't seeing that. But we were just seeing her being a, a, a decent friend to him. And then in this episode, they really connected more. And I thought, you know, there, there was that moment where he's like, "I'm I'm going to dance with you now." Um, and he danced with Tasha and I thought, oh, hey, this is where that could go. And then maybe Joy and Boyd just become friends and, and maybe it's the, the season two twist where now we're following Rachel pining for Ross. We're going to follow Joy pining for Boyd. Yeah, I mean, that, that's possible. But I have to say what you're saying about Tasha, that makes sense because it's a natural progression. Again, we're only six episodes in, but who knows how long, how much time has passed. But there's something there. They have a history, even if it's only five episodes. And again, I, I, I stopped watching the show. I didn't watch the second season. I don't know if it goes anywhere, if they do get together or not, Tasha and Boyd. But it doesn't matter because that's very much in the moment. If they're just... I say just, if they're good friends who remain good friends, that's a very endearing moment to see. If they're good friends who could be something more and eventually it evolves, that's something we could see. And if they're friends that don't evolve or it doesn't work out, I mean, there there is a bevy, which is a word I've never used, um, of plot lines. And I'm curious because I where would that show have gone? I don't remember how this episode winds up. Oh, well, God, up. don't forget, talk about... Uh, unexpected storyline suddenly wyleen is a country singer oh yeah that's right <laughs> that that threw Poor me Wileen. off more than anything that i mean you're talking that might have been mentioned in an earlier episode that, but i'm not positive that I'm, I'm gonna have to hope that it was because otherwise it's out of nowhere and nobody <laughs> reacts to it <laughs> <laughs> not even the canned studio audience yeah, there she is not scheduled to be the performer she goes on stage and and Everyone that knows her is just like, yep, whatever. That's just something she does, apparently. Yeah, and it's too bad. Because, again, that character, I probably got slowly moved off the show. Wileen probably got rolled back. But this episode did have a sense of these characters. Uh, having watched it, it took two episodes to realize this. I think it's a nice example of how this block of time, Must See TV, would offer up shows. You know, it, th those two hours are almost like... Um, <laughs> Almost like a rotating anthology series, you know, that synthesized <laughs> sure. and kind of complemented whatever made friends work, I guess. But just kind of, without going out of its way, attempted to give us something to relate to. Yeah. And that's harmless. And that's fine. And it's unfortunate that it played to the darker aspects of what it meant to be a 21-year-old person. In college, you know, pursuing relationships, but uh, I enjoyed these episodes. I, I I was surprised that I wanted to see them when it came up as a topic, but uh, yeah, I thought they were fine. Yeah. They're available on YouTube illegally, legally, currently. We could say they're currently, available currently. Yes, if you want to check them out. Um, I think that's it. That's that's <clears throat> I think it. That's man. it for this show. This was a light one, an easy one, but I enjoyed it. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did enjoy the show and like to enjoy some others check out 20popcast.com that's the uh, main website for the show you can always stream the most recent episode right there on the home page you can also you can also excuse me find links to um how to subscribe to us on apple podcasts on stitcher google play we're trying to get up onto um uh, not Spotify. Is it Spotify? There is a thing called Spotify. Yes, trying to get on Spotify, working on that. But, you know, just any way that you listen to your podcast, for the most part, we're probably on it. So we would ask if you enjoyed the show, please uh, subscribe to the show there. You can also follow us on Twitter at 20popcast, on Instagram also at uh, 20popcast. And I would beg you, I would actually say today with hands clasped in front of my chest, pretending to be on my knees, if you do listen to the show, 
and you do enjoy the show. I know it's an effort to do that. But also, if you could leave us a review, um, if you listen to us on Apple Podcasts or whatever um, uh, 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 the podcast device you listen to us on, just leave a short little review. They can let you review with stars. You can type a little bit about what you like or don't like about the show. It, it really helps us. The show is growing. I'm working on growing. There's a couple other things coming up or coming down the line. So please, I don't know. I know this is desperate. God, this sounds so desperate. But if you're enjoying the show, what would help us out would be to leave a little review. Also, to go into our show notes and look up the theme song, Super Poppy, by the musician Komiku. Um, you can download the track along with this closing theme, um, both at the Free Music Archive. Again, there's le- links in the show notes. I say that because we've been using that theme for about a year and a half. I love it. And this is someone who's allowing us through how I read his website anyways <laughs> to use the theme for free. Bob, what can people do to contact you? Well, they can reach out on, on Twitter as well, at our H. Canning. Uh, they can also follow the show on Facebook and leave comments there. And yeah, I think you can still listen to us on Facebook. Is that correct? You can. That's another another avenue, another platform for hearing 20th century pop. Um, so yeah, thanks. Please reach out. I always like to hear from people um, about the show. Right? Oh, and if you're listening and you happen to be the male Airy Gross, thanks for liking my tweet. I thought that would be of more interest, I, but okay. I, I, that's, that's... Well, I know we're closing it up, but I'd love to hear that story. What was the oh, tweet? Oh, that's the story. He liked the tweet where I added him, and I realized <laughs> that the at Airy Gross that I added was not the same Airy Gross, or uh, this other Airy Gross saw the name and liked it back. So whoever it was, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, that story. You know what would make that story more exciting? Any other celebrity, <laughs> probably. Any other name. Any other Trailer Howard, the real... Perhaps. Well, it's not so much Trailer <laughs> Howard, but but I'm sure there are people out there who'd be like, oh, Branch and Pinchot like my, yeah, right. That's pretty good. Ram Man from the Masters of the Universe knows I exist. Super. 